Hello everyone, my name is Stefan and I run the channel Lush and Salty Aquariums. I'm delighted to participate in a collaboration with Zach at Aquafinity to talk about and show you some of the aquariums in my fish room in my apartment in Chicago. Most people who have a fish room have a nice place kind of tucked away either in the basement or a shed, whereas my fish room and this big display tank right here is in the center of my apartment which is this lovely vintage building built in 1935. My wife's an interior designer and she helped put together this fabulous space while she obliged me in keeping my fish tanks and a fish room and she knows what that entails. It was sort of an unsaid rule that it better be neat. It had to be in tip-top shape. But nevertheless, I have held up my end of the bargain and I can't wait to show you how I did it. Okay, so this is the 135 gallon freshwater display system. This aquarium is my pride and joy. It's the mother of all my tanks, biggest by far. And it just has a plethora of life inside of it. But you can see the robust and healthy life just thriving and going nuts inside of this tank. I mean, I, I love it, right? And it better be sweet because it's in my dining room and we see this whenever we have dinner, whenever we have company over. It needs to be really a thing of beauty and I'd like to think that it is and I hope you agree. We've got angelfish, classic. There's the iconic silver angelfish and that's the veal tail version. We've got uh, millennium rainbow fish in here, three intense males. Look at those things. They're like the size of coffee cups and that gorgeous rust red, straight through solid color. There is the underrated dwarf neon rainbow fish. I've got a whole group of those, but I'm sort of following this guy around. There's a female Bosmani rainbow fish, another female. Um, obviously I've got some males in here too, because those are the ones that are the most beautiful. Let's see, as we cruise along, there's one of many many bristle nose catfish. I have all different kinds of uh, variations on the uh, bushy nose or the ancestress catfish. And I've actually found a spawn in here, a number of babies. And if we could, let me see, is that a bit? Nope, that's, yeah, there's a little one. I didn't put these little catfish in here. They have just come out of the woodwork, literally. I mean, I know that's an expression, but, um, Somewhere along the way, two of my bristlenose spawned within the hardscape here, which is a couple pieces of bogwood and some ciru stone. And there's all kinds of hidey holes in there. There's one of the male Bosmani rainbow fish. Uh, and there I have a, you can see this gorgeous sword tail. I've got a few of those that I picked up at a swap here in Chicago. There's another one. These black mollies, I'm glad they're in here. They, were, they're, they do help clean algae, but honestly, I didn't put them in here. I put baby black mollies from my fish room in here to feed the cichlids and rainbows, and a couple of them escaped, and they've grown up in, into uh, these robust and fabulous creatures you see here. I've got Harlequin Rasboras, a school, and a school of Cardinal Tetras as well. And let's see, where's the, ah, the Opaline Garamis behind this, <laughs> behind Godzilla here, one of my mystery snails. I have two Opaline Garamis. Funny thing about those fish, let me see if I can get the other one in frame. There he is, or she. I always thought they were among the more drab versions of Garami, let alone fish in general. I will tell you, I'm not being glib, those are among the most favored fish whenever anyone's wa uh, watching this tank. They say, I like that one, that's my favorite. So go figure, right? And they are beautiful, especially uh, under the um, dappling light that breaks through the plant cover, uh, showing off those gorgeous sort of that tigery pattern and the speckles and the shimmer, really beautiful fish. Um, and so I deserve to be slapped for underrating it in my own aquarium, if you can believe it. So plant life, I've got these dwarf, uh, these tiger lotus here, and um, there's some cryptocorn balance, an elegant uh, flowy, maybe the most elegant and flowy cryptocorn there is with those sort of variegated leaves or the little rippling effect in the leaves. 
Got all kinds of other crypts in here that create that forest you see down here, moving across. There's some Busa philandra there. I don't, have, that's a harder plant for me to get going, but I have a couple varieties in that area alone and they're doing really, really well. They flowered for me as a matter of fact. And then I have Vallisneria and sword plants. And there's some Pogo stem and octopus in here as well, which I use as kind of a filler. In my smaller tanks, it dominates, but in, and that's what we're looking at here. But in this tank, it's kind of just a filler plant to do a job like all these plants do. I overstock my aquariums and I know it, but one of the ways to offset problems that come with having a lot of fish is to have a lot of plants. It's really the biggest tip. Zach asked to provide like my tips. Plants are your best friend. They will help you clean the water and keep a system intact, healthy, thriving, and they allow me and they will allow you to keep a crap ton of animals, invertebrates, fish, and I have, uh, as you can see, all that and then some. All right, so that's this tank in terms of the livestock. It runs on a sump and that's a whole other awesome tank under a tank. You see the refugium there? It's got um, biomedia, uh, uh, sets of sponges right over here. The water comes in through there, moves across the biomedia, then through the refugium, and then the Cice pump. And Cice is a great manufacturer of pumps, an Italian company, pumps the water back up and over. And that's how the cycle goes with the sump. I run CO2 in this tank, and for a big aquarium, you're gonna need um, two, you're gonna need a lot of CO2 coming out. And um, so I have two diffusers, one on each side of the aquarium, here in the back there, I think you can see it. That's a Jardly, they're large size. I'm really happy with it. And I have the same one all the way on the other side of the aquarium. And then for the regulator, I have the UNS with the dual uh, ability there. And you see both, uh, the, both of the uh, tubes coming out. One goes to one side and one goes to the other. And that's a five pound canister. So that's this tank. It's my display. It's my pride and joy. Moving on. All right, leaving the display tank in my dining room, we're gonna venture through this doorway and into my fish room proper. As I said, it bisects the kitchen and the dining room. This is by no means a tucked away fish room, but rather almost a thoroughfare in my house. Right now, my young adult children can come over and appreciate the fish room. Look at that wallpaper. My wife helped find that for me. Isn't that the neatest thing? Against uh, this black paint to make all these aquariums just explode and pop with color. I've got six aquariums in here and a live brine shrimp hatchery, which is operating right there. On the top shelf of this rack system is where I keep some of my collectibles from the hobby. You see some vintage packaging with that, with those stunning and fun graphics. Porcelain bubblers from the 50s and even earlier than that. There's an old Jewel Aquarium that's actually a Chicago company that's brass and, and glass. I've seen one on Etsy for thousands of dollars. I paid like 50 bucks for that one. Finally, last but not least, these Penplex, what I call craptacular aquarium figures that you would stick a tube on and let the bubble. Some of them would float up and down when they're bubbling in the tank. I mean, even as a kid, I didn't put that stuff in my aquarium, but I love collecting it now and I have a handful in their boxes still. They used to be really cheap and easy to find, but collectors have sort of uh, glommed onto them. The pandemic made everybody a collector and everybody a fish keeper. The collectibles that would normally be found in any given flea market have become a lot more desirable. I've got a bunch of them actually over here as well with some uh, older aquarium books. And I keep my supplies in these lovely sort of teak stained wooden boxes that I got at the container store. I highly recommend going to the container store if you want something more aesthetically pleasing than just plastic bins. These are relatively inexpensive and they usually have a ton and you can just buy five or six and sort of put your rocks and your 
your wood or you can do a, what I'm doing and that's sort of a combination of both some of the collectibles as well as rocks, wood and driftwood. And then as we go in the back, you see some of my supplies which are hidden behind my primary chair. Pieces that I adore from the rest of my life. I collect old leather jackets and there's a patched up one there, a shot perfecto from the 70s. Now you can see Elmo, one of our uh, old dogs that we have. Elmo likes to sit there with me. From that chair, I look right at this aquarium, not a TV, but this aquarium, and I'm okay with that. No TVs in this room. And everywhere we turn our head, there's an aquarium or something to look at. But here's, here's an old painting from the turn of last century, so late 1800s, of an, an aquascape. Obviously no one's keeping uh, all, a goldfish and paradise fish and frogs and all the other things in here in an aquarium, but uh, it does show a pretty interesting look, feel, and design. And then this is pretty cool. These are old matchbooks that feature uh, different hobby fish. These are from England. I found a group of them on Etsy uh, and I had them uh, framed. I just fell in love with them. So back in the day, cigarette manufacturers would put all kinds of stuff on matchbooks to attract uh, collectors uh, and get them, you know, buying their tobacco products and what have you. Uh, and aquarium fish was just one of the many, many things that you could find on matchbooks and uh, other things back in the 50s. This is a really cool picture from a book that has more aquarium fish. This is from I think the 20s or 30s, like a textbook or just an aqu aquarium hobbyist book. So all that stuff, you know, plants that grow outside of your aquarium, fun wallpaper, collectibles. I mean, it's all enhancements to the hobby for me. A bit about this racking system. With the, me with the metal, there's so much you can do in terms of uh, helping yourself out. This grid here, as I pan down, you can see I hung, like these are what you would put tools on in in a garage. You just stick all your aquascaping and fish keeping equipment into the little racks. You can use the magnets to just stick things upon the actual metal here. On and on it goes. I also got some acrylic plastic, which saves my life because water is a forever going to be dripping from one tank or another, especially when you're doing water changes. But these custom made plastic are form fitted to this size. I got these from Tap Plastics and whatever racking system you have, chances are you can order one that's custom made to fit your system. And then when you have spills and God knows what else, a dead fish, anything you might find, especially in the back where it can get kind of gnarly, you just wipe it with a cloth and it's, it looks like it's new again. That's why, I mean, I really admire fish keepers who build uh, those ones with wood or use cinder block. And, but to have these little grooves enable you to do so much with your tools. On the top, these grooves allowed me to hang a light literally using twist ties from the top of them and I didn't have to use the elaborate hanging kit or the mounting brackets that came with the light. I could just twisty tie them onto the bottom of this rack here and I was good to go. Every fish keeper is gonna need one of these, not a door per se, but a storage area because if you don't have a place to keep all your fish keeping stuff, it's gonna litter the room and I can't have a messy fish room because it's a thoroughfare in my family's home. And you know, my wife would get real sick of my hobby if she's had to look at this. In here, I also raise different cultures of live food. I've got potato beetle larva and I've got some microworms. A lot of people do this stuff when they're trying to condition fish for breeding or when they're feeding fry, but I just like feeding my fish live food. I think you need two or three really good quality staples and then augment that with live food and you should be really good. Baby brine shrimp, which is what's happening in that Zeiss. It's, it's a brand called Zeiss. It starts with a Z. It's a brine fish hatchery. Nothing competes with baby brine shrimp. Adult brine shrimp 
don't have anywhere near the nutritional value that their babies have. And so raising the, ba the baby brine shrimp or BBS, as a kid, we also called sea monkeys. I feed almost all my fish these baby brine shrimp and they just go nuts for it. This is my 20 gallon Owase Siniscaper. It's a system that was originally not available in the United States, but they just started selling this. It's a rimless aquarium. Inside I've got an ADA Superjet canister filter and a UNS a mini regulator, which I adore. And that's a paintball canister. And up top I have a Chihiro's light, which is great. It works on an app. The tank itself, heavily planted. This is recently trimmed. You see on the left, Pogostem and Octopus. That's this plant here. Now it's trimmed, so it has a wonderful sort of uniform look, but it can become big. This is some Rotala H R, I believe, with the red tips. I just cut it so that the fabulous red is not really pronounced, but within a week or so, it'll be up to the top, all red and glorious. And then on the right here is Lemon Floria, or Lemon Philia sessiflora, a really fast growing stem plant, a nice alternative to Cabamba, which can be a little more tricky for some, but those are the three rows of stems in the back. The middle tier of this tank has a bunch of epiphytes and cryptocorn, uh, and that really cool dragonstone making kind of like a pike's peak, uh, which has also been accentuated by one specimen of cryptocorn balance. And then of course on the bottom, I've got a carpet of dwarf sage and dwarf hair grass, which is pretty intense at this point. For livestock, I've got a group of albino longfin coriodoras, cherry shrimp, and some red Bexford pencil fish. And although for whatever reason, they're not readily apparent, I've got some gold tetras. You see them shimmering in the back there and a group of green neon tetras. Although the tank is showing off really well, some of the fish are still in the back. All right, this is my 12 gallon bookshelf aquarium. It's made by Lifeguard Aquatics, a nice competitor to some of the more known and expensive brands and I love this aquarium. It sits atop, second of the highest shelf on my racking system. Some of the floaters have started to grow atop the structure on this side and moving across I have pothos and some stick making a fun background and then this great canopy which has a terrific uh, thick intense covering of moss, I forget which kind, and various forms of pothos, which have created one of the best features in this aquarium. Look at that rootstock. It's growing into the substrate. Some people don't like that. I think it's awesome for spawning uh, and just for the aesthetic. This is the wild or margaritas pencil fish right there. You see an autosynclus or a pygmy coriodora on that leaf there and a whole slew of Neocaridina uh, swimming in and out of frame. These are chili rasboras, which there's a small group in here. Beautiful, intense red color. That was a neon blue rasbora that you just saw kicking around. Voila, there they are. <laughs> Three of them out of nowhere, it seems. That's a super fired up male, a small female. That's the bookshelf. This is my 32 gallon long bookshelf aquarium. It's a little big to be really sitting on any bookshelf, but it's on my racking system. So we're safe, we're good to go. Inside here are primarily live bears, various different kinds of mollies, platies, and swordtails, as well as some white cloud mountain minnows, the longfin variety, and uh, a group of uh, black schwartz eye Coriodoras and gold laser Coriodoras. There's one big uh, Siamese algae eater and there is a Borneo loach right there sucking up on the glass. The Hillstream loaches are a wonderful addition to any aquarium. They're easy to keep and not that difficult to breed. For plants, I've got quite a few, but let me highlight the Blixa japanica, which is this intense grass-like plant here. I can't believe how well it's doing. This can be tricky for some. It needs light and CO2. Now I have both those elements in here, but I think it's the clay 
underpinning of this aqua soil. I used only in this tank Oliver Knott's clay-based aqua soil. He's a British brand and aquascaper and this is the only tank where I use any of his material and it might be why this Blixa Japanica is doing so well. I haven't the heart to cut it or prune it. I just want to see how far it'll grow and go. I've got epiphytes, some sword plants kind of hiding the hardscape which in the beginning was sort of a river river style in that it got big and then down to just sand over here but over time it's just become a lush and intense planted aquarium i have jungle veil in the back so a slight tip with that is you don't need to put a background in the tank it's actually a wall of green in the back there you see so you don't need to put a black background or anything like that. Now these live bears are, you know, pro intensely productive and their fry of these live bear fish are everywhere, but it's still, the fish are very healthy and the colors and sizes, I'm just very captivated by. All right, this is what I call the partial black water aquarium i say partial because honestly it's really more of a intensely planted tank like all my others except in this one i encourage the formation of tannins by putting these botanicals at the bottom as well as i did not treat the driftwood in the back so in the beginning the water was quite tea stained and to this day it is my most acidic tank the lowest ph which is good because one of the inhabitants in this system is much 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 more happy in an aquarium that has very low ph and it wouldn't be these neons which are delighted to be in low ph but they can certainly survive in a higher ph water because they are bred so often in the hobby that they become completely comfortable in almost any water condition providing you have uh, suitable temperatures and clean water these are super fat and happy as you can see they're also very aggressive eaters get the food before anything else can including the fish which I'm going to try and find for you here. And the reason I set up the black water tank in the first place, uh, what they are, uh, are licorice garamis. And I have about four or five in here. There's one back there, do you see them? Isn't that beautiful? They are very small and very fragile. They prefer live foods and they also prefer that um, soft acidic water that I talked about. I believe this one's a male. It's got the, a darker color, a little bit more robust fins, but I have four or five of them in here and I'm hoping that they'll spawn even though now that I have these neons, which are so aggressive, I rather doubt the fry would survive. There's a beautiful grouping of Anubias, different varieties. I'm using petrified wood because it's inert. It will not raise the pH in your water. I've got obviously the driftwood and the botanicals and aqua soil from UNS. All those things will contribute to a lower pH, more like the South American waters that these fish are familiar with. Like in one of my other tanks, this intense tangle of root growth. And how cool is that, right? So that is from the pothos hanging down and growing around the top of this water. I also have Brazilian pennywort in here, which is a great fast growing plant. Um, that's this one here, if you forgive the reflection from the light. Light is from Chihiros. It's their least expensive brand of aquarium light. It's about $75, but they call that their quote unquote king of value. Uh, which is a, a sort of funny Chinese way of talking about their entry level model. Uh, since I wasn't going to use any stem plants or plants that require intense lighting, and I was going for the black water in the beginning, and I have all these top water plants, I figured it didn't make any sense to invest in a more robust light. There are some Neocaridina in here, as well as Pygmy Coriodorus and various snail populations. You see a red ram's horn and a bladder snail. Uh, the bladder snail is on the right. Bladder snails uh, are considered more of a pest than ram's horn, but they both can be problematic if their populations get 
too big. I don't really have that problem because I try not to feed too much. There's another licorice garami down here, sort of camouflaging next to those little leaves. You see that one um, leaf about the same size just below him? You can see why they're comfortable, not only for the effect on the water, but because of how they blend in. There's some pygmy coriodoras back there. I also have finally, and I'm gonna find one for you, what they call a Morse code tetra. And these tetras are uh, adorable in that they have a pattern on their sides that resembles a little bit like the dot, dot, dash, dash. There's a pygmy coriador. There's a couple of them actually. And they're starting to see me, so they're thinking it's food time. And I'm gonna try to get super close. I don't see any of the Morse code tetras. It doesn't mean obviously they're not in here. Although I am a little concerned, I'm wondering why I don't see them. Oh well, you can't win them all, but there's certainly plenty to look at. Looking down is one of the, this is one of the better top down views in my fish room, which is so cool, right? Okay, everybody, here we have my simplest setup in the fish room. That doesn't mean it's any less busy or robust. It was just super simple to create. I mean, you could do this in an hour. It's a five gallon Petco special. They're 5.5 gallon. I've got all the pothos rimming around it and a little, it's the only aquarium where I'm actually using a sponge filter. I love sponge filters for breeders. Uh, for breeding purposes and um, practicality and ease of use, but I don't, they don't bring me the intense filtration and the aesthetic appeal that I like in, the, in my other planted tanks, but in this one, it's just fine. So I'm using just mats of java fern. I literally bought them on coconut fiber, two mats of java fern. That's sort of one clump there and one clump there. Then I have some homegrown cuttings of my own java fern and I I don't really have an aqua soil or any substrate in here. I just put a whole bunch of botanicals, sticks and twigs and leaves and let the mulm accumulate. There's some moss in there, some roots, tons of shrimp. I've got hornwort, hornwort, that's this uh, feathery plant there, and Brazilian pennywort uh, all over this aquarium to just create that chaotic jungle lots of snails there's not much i can do about them it's okay because they're churning through all that mulm like these neocaridina shrimp and the water parameters in this aquarium given how much stuff is in it are actually pretty good i don't have any problems i don't really address the sponge filter all that often it's bubbling very nicely in the back there. I'm hoping these celestial pearl, pearl daniels will breed for me, but I'm not looking for the fry or holding my breath about that. It would be fun. And if I do see the fry, any survivors will probably be those little like fingernail slivers you might see at the top or uh, on the glass still. Java fern is tricky for me but in, on a mat on coconut fiber, it seems to be doing okay. I mean, it's robust. You see all that yellow and some black spots. It bothers me in my more fancier aquascapes when that happens, but in this one, I think it's all part of the appeal. But I don't use java fern all that often in my other scapes because I think it's often thought of to be an easier plant than it really is. And I don't like the effect of all the black spots and little plantlets that will grow on its leaves uh, very, very often in, the, in this hobby and in other people's tanks. Kind of unruly and a little, I don't know, decrepit looking in a fancy aquascape. But in this one, you know, bring it on. I think it's kind of awesome. Celestial Pearl Danios are a adorable little fish. They look just like brook trout as you can see here. Literally like a miniature trout that I would catch if I was fly fishing in a river. Very, very easy to breed for most people. They're an egg scatterer, but that being said, uh, amongst egg laying fishes, they're in the e easier side of things. I have a Pocostomus, a couple juveniles in here. They're too big when they get older for this aquarium, but as juveniles, 
they're all right and good luck with catching them out but they will contribute to the veining of these almond leaves now there's just the stick of the leaf all the flesh has been uh, devoured by the invertebrates in here as well as the Placostomus. Placostomus love to scrape off the detris and all the biofilm and everything that forms on these leaves which is why we put them in our aquariums not just to release tannins but also to support the web of life and that veining effect on that almond leaf is a great example. It only took a, a week or two for that to happen. Some people pull those sticks out and put new leaves in. I will put new leaves in. I might just leave the dying one in there though. When it comes to maintenance, I am a believer in water changes. I do a pretty rigorous 40, 50% water change once a week in most of my tanks, even if the water parameters are reasonable uh, to good. I just totally believe in the idea of water changes, taking the bad stuff out, putting new fresh water in. I see the invigorating effect it has on my fish. My eyes tell me what some of some of the science might want to debate and that, you know, my fish seem to appreciate it. And since I keep heavily stocked tanks with a lot of plants, now yeah, plants mean you don't have to do water changes, but on the other side of that, they're dropping leaves, black spots, there's some rotten plant matter, you might not even see it. But you know, that stuff's in there and it's creating ammonia. And um, you know, so while plants do uh, keep your water clean, they're also a living thing that becomes a non-living thing. And you know, I just like to get that out of there. So I trim leaves, I do pretty extensive water gardening as I call it. And like I said, 40, 50% water changes in most of my tanks. Now, in a couple of the aquariums, I don't do that much water changes. I try to keep the pH very low in those. And so if I put Chicago tap water in, which is, you know, about 7.4, which is not bad. That's not terribly hard, but still I want it closer to 6.4. And so I like to keep that water as soft and as acidic as possible. And I, I, I play around in a couple tanks with the extent or the amount of water that I'll change, but generally speaking, once a week, 40%. I like to clean my canister filters once every couple months. Now the two Awaze, they come with pre-filters, which is a, a really neat bonus for them in that you can just clean out the pre-filter and slip it back in and it generally extends the life of the filter in general. And in the other canisters, you know, I look at water flow. When the water flow starts to become conspicuously slower, I mean, I just figure it's time for change, right? So I, I sort of read the room when it comes to doing filter cleans. For those of you with hang on backs, obviously if your water's backing up into the tank, you've got to clean the filter, right? It's just, you just can see with your eyes, God forbid, smell with your nose, that it's time to do something in your tank. I don't have any odors in my fish room that would just not fly with certainly my spouse, but not even me. I, I don't like that kind of organic vibe. Elmo's over here sitting on my laptop, which could be a total fail. This guy right there. Hey Elmo, get off my computer. Timers, everything's on a timer, I've consistency. So maintenance and consistency kind of go hand in hand. You don't want to start doing anything very strange and abnormal for some reason or another. You want to try to make it within the biorhythms of the aquarium. When thinking about how long I've been in this fabulous hobby, I mean, like a lot of you since childhood, some of my earliest memories were of collecting things out in nature, um, putting them in jars, putting them in boxes. I had a box of uh, crickets on my back porch. I had a pet black widow spider, which terrified my mother and pretty much anyone else. I had a pet Madagascar cockroach in college. So I was really big with the ladies, <laughs> but fish, right? That was the most wholesome and ultimately long-term of my natural obsessions. One I keep to this day, as a matter of fact, I've magnified it. My first fish tank, maybe I was 11, 12 at the latest, actually much earlier because I know I wasn't anywhere near a teenager yet, but I had a bowl 
it'd be almost vintage now as one of these sort of like Victorian oval, not oval, but sort of a cr half crescent and maybe about a half a gallon tops. For whatever reason, it wasn't guppies or a goldfish. It was um, black mollies. I remember I had a pair of black mollies. There was some gravel may and maybe some shells, which uh, I would never put in most freshwater systems. But fortunately for black mollies, calcium and some of that stuff was actually good for that fish, being that mollies are often brackish. The black mollies spawned for me, or they dropped some fry. I still remember vividly the those the little like black bowling ball that would come out of the mother fish's tummy and fall to the bottom and then open up into a little fish and kind of kick around. Uh, I was hooked really at that point, I'm, I'm not kidding. Now, as I grew up, you know, went to college, I tended to have some kind of fish tank at all times, but there were periods where I didn't. And when I was raising a young family, I had one community tank. And then when my daughters got a little older, I would set one up for one and then another, and I ended up taking care of them. And uh, I would take one down, put one, but I never got super, super serious into it until I had moved to California. And this was really only just a handful of years ago that I did my first fish room. A lot of the nano tanks have a lot of heart in them and I'm passionate about them, but they're sort of goofy, random and willy nilly, if I'm being honest. And there's nothing wrong with that, especially if you're doing a jungle tank. And that was some of my best stuff was when it was more let nature do its thing. But that was Fish Room 1.0. And then when I came back to Chicago, one of the things I definitely wanted to do was the 2.0 high tech and as cool as I was capable of making it. And that's sort of where I'm at right now. When I came to thinking about some hacks that I have learned along the way that make this hobby easier and also create a value add benefit, they're conveniently in my sump, but I use them in the fish room as well. All over the place, you know I love emerged plants. It's not really a hack per se, but you, yeah it is because they suck up nitrates from the water. I, I have these in most of my aquariums, but you can really see uh, how those root systems and this ref refugium are sucking up nitrates as the water makes its way through this filter. So hack number one is emergent plants. If you're new and you're looking for ways to further filter your tank, go with plants that grow outside of your aquarium, not just inside. Pothos, in which you see a couple of varieties here, are awesome. You don't have to necessarily ever buy a pothos. They're, they're sort of ubiquitous and everywhere. There's a ton of other plants that, that'll also grow really well out of the water. Pothos, of which you see here, is the end all be all. It's almost fail safe. A true hack is would I put them in? And there's other uses for this little contraption. What you're looking at here, you don't have to buy anything special in order to put these plants into your aquarium. There are a bunch of ways you can go about doing this. The first way is to just lay them on top of the water and have the stem sort of balancing across some of your plastic, like, like sort of you see here behind the light there. What's really cool is this. This is about five bucks at the dollar store, if that, and it's a toothbrush holder that you would put in your shower with a suction cup. So you just buy a couple of those, they're everywhere. You can get them online as well. And you just stick them on the side of your tank and they're black, they're white, they're clear, and then throw in a bunch of stems and see how where the water line is. It's halfway up and that's perfect. And you see the roots coming out? I mean, how cool is that? Another really cool hack are, are these little stick of magnets. You can buy them on Amazon or anywhere. You'd be amazed at how many applications a magnet can have. For example, both that LED pad as well as that hockey puck light, those are both just stuck up here with magnets. It'll just stick right up and same with the LED. And uh, so magnets, magnets, magnets. What a, a great little thing to have around in your fish room. There's more uses than even the one I just pointed out. The reason I'm showing this aquarium with the lights out, it's evening time and 
My lights are all on timers, been off for some time now. I have an air stone that's attached to a timer as well. The air stone comes on at night, but not during the day. The reason for that is one, you might not want the added distraction of strong aeration if you have a serene planted tank. Why I do it is critical and that's the main reason and that is CO2. In the daytime, I'm running CO2 in most of my tanks to get this intense plant growth. CO2 only gets taken in by the plants during photosynthesis and that only happens at the part where they process CO2 when the lights are on. Running an air stone during that period would remove CO2 from the water. So you'd be putting it in and the bubbler would be taking it out. So if you're running an air stone and CO2 at the same time, you're wasting one thing or the other. So in nighttime when the lights are out, you do your air stone. And in the daytime when the lights are on, you run your CO2. It's built in right there. And so, you know, you can control when that comes on and off and kicks in with a timer, same as the air stone. And I'm doing that in two of my tanks. This is the other one. You see the bubbles coming out while the lights are out as well. Timers, you know, you gotta have them. If you're doing a fish room without timers, you're gonna be, First of all, it's a pain in the ass. And second of all, you're gonna have a mistake. You're gonna forget to turn something on or off. It's gonna hurt your plant growth. Consistency is such an important part of this hobby. Timers make it easy. The CO2 and light differential is a really cool factor and I wanted to show you that. When it comes to using fertilizers for my planted aquariums, I do use them at the beginning of a tank setup more so than as the tank evolves and all my tanks are now in a much more mature phase i use something like aquarium co-ops general or thrive i'll do that once a week a minimum dosage in all of my tanks bit after i do a water change and a filter change everybody knows you need to condition your tap water before you put it into your aquarium. I trust Seachem Prime and, and that's what I use. And something like Thrive or Aquarium Co-op's General Fertilizer once a week, maybe a little more in the beginning to get the plants rocking and rolling. I hope you appreciated this review of my fish room and my approach to the hobby. I'd like to thank Zach at Aquafinity for allowing me to collaborate. As I like to say at the end of all my videos. Keep your hands in the tank and ciao for now.